ASP.NET Core Security with Christian Vence. The Azure DevOps Podcast is a show for developers and DevOps professionals shipping software using Microsoft technologies. Each show brings you hard-hitting interviews with industry experts, innovating better methods, and sharing success stories. Listen on to learn how to increase quality, ship quickly, and operate well. And now your host, Jeffrey Palermo. Welcome to the show. I'm Jeffrey Palermo, your host for helping you and your teams move fast, deliver quality, and to run your software with confidence in Azure, all while using everything that the .NET ecosystem has to offer. This podcast is sponsored by ClearMeasure, a software architecture company that empowers .NET teams to be self-sufficient and able to deliver world-class results using its ClearMeasure Way methodology. My architecture forums are going strong. First announcement, signups are up for the next sessions. And so if you lead a software team and are looking to collaborate with peer architect leaders, then you can go ahead and sign up at the link in the show notes. And for those of you who are looking for programming with Palermo, my video podcast, just go ahead and search in any of the directories and you'll be able to find it. And you'll be able to find it also on YouTube. So let's get into the guest today. We have Christian Vents, and he works as a consultant, trainer, and author with focus on web technologies and is an author or co-author of over 100 computer books. And he regularly contributes to various IT magazines and speaks at conferences around the globe. Christian holds a diploma, which is the German equivalent of a master's degree in computer science and one in business informatics. And in his day job, he is one of the founders of a web agency, Arabiata Solutions, and we'll include a link to that in the show notes. And they have offices in Munich, Germany, in London, UK, and he also frequently works with development teams to make their applications better performing, more secure, and more reliable. Christian, welcome to the show. How are you, sir? Thanks for having me, Jeffrey. Long time no see. That's right. That's right. We've sort of uh, known each other for what 2011 what is that 12 12 years <laughs> when we yeah, first met I mean, maybe it's, I mean, you're your mvp since i think 2006 Six? or 7 if that is that right yeah and maybe even longer four was my first year so long, long time, time long time my friend of course you're in europe and uh, i'm in i'm in the us and but you've written a hundred computer books i want to dive into that it's a just hundred, a side how, hobby how many per month is that <laughs> Uh, you know, when, when I was younger, right? <laughs> when, when I was younger, no, I, I, I found out that, uh, that, that writing books is something that I, that I uh, enjoy and I'm pretty proficient at, uh, also speed-wise. So again, when, when I was younger, um, I, was, uh, I was writing, well, actually a few a year, mm. but this has uh, since then uh, stalled down significantly. Um, so uh, nowadays, I am still maintaining uh, some some of the books where the topic is still relevant, so updating it to the latest version. And very, very rarely, um, I I sometimes even do a new one. So actually, I I did I did write a new book uh, last year, ASP.NET Core Security. It's a book which you know I always wanted to write, mm -hmm. um, but never never found the time to do so, or wasn't pushed hard enough into doing it. Uh, and so eventually I was approached at the right time um, by the right publisher and then I, I did it. And I mean, I, I love web application security. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's a thing, you know, as, as a topic, I kind of found this uh, as a topic for myself uh, over 10 years, uh, over 20 years ago uh, in 2001 or two. And, you know, back then, again, I was younger. I was still writing book instead of about uh, writing books instead of having a proper job mm -hmm. <laughs> um and uh i thought okay you know that that would be a temporary thing because security that sounds like like something that that is that is automatically there and you know tools getting better we as developers getting better <laughs> it wouldn't be a problem yeah. at, at one point yeah. in the future that's what i thought back then Look where I am. So uh, security right. is still an important topic. Actually, to me, I, I don't know what you're thinking, but to me, the situation seems to to degrade by, by the week. Well, right? I want to. I have so, a lot of questions I, about yeah. security for you. Before we get into them, just so the listeners understand, if they've yeah. never never read any of your books or, or heard you speak, 
just your breadth of experience, kind of go back in time for us. What are all the technologies that you, you've worked on? Just give us some of the high points of your experience so the listeners understand where you're coming from. Yeah, actually, that's that's pretty easy. So I I, I made a major decision 25 years ago now that I would uh, focus on doing web applications. You know, back mm -hmm. in the days where it wasn't considered real programming, but um, uh, how the, the way things turned kind of turned it uh, in, in my favor. Um, so I, I said I would always focus on what the the majority of the market is doing. Right. So front end stuff is front end stuff, and on the back end, I started with. Uh, ASP, Active Server Pages, classical ASP yes, from Microsoft. in the 90s. And PHP, because they have the same age, actually. So uh, they were released in the same year. And then I, I, I've been sticking with uh, PHP, which is still going strong. And then ASP, the ASP side uh, of, of me, so to speak, was then gradually replaced by ASP.NET, Web Forms, then later ASP.NET MVC, and now I'm a happy ASP.NET Core user and developer. Hmm. And there are some other things which I touch, but I mean, how, how many people are listening into that podcast? Hopefully no one Thousands. knows me because <laughs> I've done a little bit of flash, maybe even some silver light, but you know, um, I was, I was young and um, yeah, but uh, I've, I've seen a lot of things come and go, um, but uh, I'm still uh, thrilled that, that web applications are running so strongly uh, yes. these days if they are secure. Right, right. And that's a well, topic that won't leave me, um, I'm, I'm afraid. Well, let's dive into that. Before we get into yeah. just ASP.NET Core specifics, let's yeah. talk about, about security. In your book, you, you, know, you go over the OWASP top 10 and, yeah. and like, you know, insecure design, broken access control, and server-side mm -hmm. request forgery. But just the whole landscape, before we get into here's what you should do in ASP.NET, how should people be thinking? What are the biggest threats and what shouldn't be ignored? So uh, you, you already mentioned the uh, the OWASP top ten. So so the OWASP is uh, for for those listeners who haven't encountered it uh, is the Open Web Application Security Project OWASP.org. It's a non for profit organization that's kind of fostering web application security by providing lots of you know documentation, tooling, checklists, guidelines, and uh, one of their their most popular uh, offerings or publications is a list of the top 10 security risks for web applications. It's not vulnerabilities, because it would be just you know, focused on attacks, mm -hmm. but risks. Because you know, everything, everything in life actually is, is risk assessment and risk management, right? You can, you, know, you can wait for the green light before crossing the street, or you can jaywalk, right? Depending on the state, there is a higher risk involved or not, both fine-wise and you know, risk-wise. Mm -hmm. um, and the same thing applies for, for web application security as well. Most security measures come with a cost. Uh, and so that's why they are gathering the, the, the list of risks. And they're using a very uh, data-driven approach. So they ask practitioners, people who conduct audits, companies uh, who do uh, automated tests, etc., to provide anonymous results of their findings in uh, a format like this. Vulnerability A or risk A was found B times in C applications. Mm. Um, and uh, from that, they try to compile a list. Now, of course, there are many more risks than just 10. So what they do is they group those items into, into buckets, basically. And then they, uh, I, I mean, that's, that, that's, that's the thing which can be biased. Before that, it's quite... The numbers are quite proper, but then, of course, some bias comes in, in the way how you are chunking things. And by that, they are uh, creating eight buckets, and the, the eight most popular buckets make eight out of the 10 items of the top 10 list. Mm -hmm. And so this, uh, and, and that's, that's why I mean that the, the list uh, is, I mean, it's, 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 it's not a real standard or something like that, but it's a great way to create awareness because everything that's important is in that list. Eight items are from that audit survey. But of course, an audit is always a look in the past, right? Because mm -hmm. it checks an application that has already been made, where the, the, the programming mistakes, for instance, were introduced maybe years ago. But of course, it's always important to see, okay, what's, what's up and coming, a look into the future. So they had a second survey where they say, okay, is there anything that is currently underrepresented, but might play a bigger role going forward? And these are the two remaining items of the list. So this, I think, is a, is a good awareness document. And awareness for me is key because 
I mean, I, I know I, I personally know companies where they say, okay, give us give us a list of of APIs that that defend against common attacks. Then they tell their developers, okay, these are the APIs you have to use. Don't ask me why you have to use them, just use them. Right? Mm -hmm. um, but I don't believe in that uh, that approach. And so, so awareness is key. I mean, there will be attacks that haven't even been invented yet, or they have yeah. been invented right. already, but we don't know about it yet. So you, you always have to have this security mindset. It can be, mm -hmm. of course, defense pro, uh, defensive programming, uh, but but in general, you always have to be aware that some things go wrong. And that's why just being aware that there's always a security risk involved in whatever you're doing, especially in web applications that are available 24-7 uh, from all around the globe. Um, you have to be aware and you have to be cautious and and and, and vigilant when uh, when working on those web applications. And that's why such an such an awareness document just just comes in greatly. The the, the knowing the API is how to defend against specific attacks or against specific threats, of course, is a must. And that's where web application security is very technology specific because every framework has a different approach. Mm -hmm. But the attacks themselves, they are technology agnostic because most attacks use the, the common denominator for a web application, uh, uh, HTTP, or maybe JavaScript, or SQL. And so you have to be aware of that something can happen, and maybe even what exactly can happen. There are companies where they, I visit them every other year, and I just you know give, give them an awareness workshop about web application security. And there are sometimes people in there that have been in that for the third, that they're, they're, they're in the in the workshop for the third time, but they still say, you know, you always forget something. Security is not the day job; it's just something they have to know. Um, and so, it's always great to have a refresher. And that's that's what I can recommend anybody. Just you know, again and again, um, make sure that you you uh, understand the fundamentals of web app security, mm -hmm. because eventually you will make a mistake in your code, right? And the, oh, yeah. the more you're aware of the risks involved, um, the less likely it is that that happens. Now, you break down different categories of the, the OAuth top 10, and one of them is insecure design, and you list three different chapters that, you know, that cover insecure design, for example. And I can hear some of the listeners say, great, insecure design. What the heck does that mean, and how do I know if my design is insecure? Well, how do you think about that? That's an excellent point. Insecure design actually is a new item in the latest edition of the top 10 list. So the, the, currently, the, the latest edition is the 2021 edition, and there's a new version out every three to four years. Mm -hmm. And insecure design is one of those which drew most of the criticism because some of the other items on the list. So for instance, uh, the third item is called injection, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, there are some surprises in there, but you know that's something where, where you have an image in your head or, or broken access control is the top item, right? That's mm -hmm. something where you say, okay, this sounds like a risk. It sounds like there are specific attacks. There might be specific countermeasures. Everything is actionable. Insecure design, I wouldn't say that's actionable. Mm -hmm. For me, that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's real hard. And uh, the, the way these, 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 this grouping works is, there is this enumeration scheme, a CWE, Common Weakness Enumeration, which basically assigns a number to each risk or uh, or attack. So, for instance, let's say a SQL injection has a number. Mm -hmm. uh, Server-side request forgery, which you mentioned, has a number. And uh, so I think the, the first item on the top 10 list has over 35-ish of, uh, of those CWEs involved, also for insecure design. So insecure design, I think, also has 30 or something. And uh, there are it's it's a complete mixed bag. So for instance, one of those items is uh, using an HTTP GET request if you have sensitive data in mm. the request, which, you know, I, I understand, right? But is that, I mean, in a way it is insecure design, right? So I have to give it to them. But uh, insecure design is also something like uh, storing passwords in clear text somewhere on disk, yeah. which is a completely different uh, kind of uh, uh kind of risk right? Um, right right and so the idea was uh, when when i finished uh, writing the book i thought okay um to see whether what i've been covering kind of matches the top 10 in uh, in a sense of not not having forgotten anything significant i was going back at the very end and then said okay this item in the top 10 list is at least in part, covered in those chapters. And mm -hmm. so great that you meant that you uh, picked out that example, 
So insecure design isn't like this one thing where you say, okay, do A, B, C, and you're you're done. It's 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 a mix of many smaller uh, smaller aspects, and that's why it's covered in three chapters because several of these different, for instance, the password storage, uh, I, I talk about uh, securely handling passwords, right? So that is covered there. But I mean, what, and that's hard to describe in a book, which is aimed at programming. The one thing you should do when, when we talk about insecure design is you have to work on your development life cycle, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I hate this, I hate shift left as a term, right? Because it turned into a marketing, uh, marketing thing, right? But the earlier you have security as part of your process, yeah. the better it is. Well, that's a good buzzword. Well, it's a whole yeah. lot better than to say, well, it's better to prevent something than to yeah. fix it after it's already out in the wild. That's too many words. <laughs> so, yeah. Isn't that that one ten hundred rule where, you know, uh, if, you, if you have a defect, if you find it during design, it costs you one unit of work. If you find it uh, later, it's 10, and then production it's 100, something like that. It's yeah, the same order thing of with magnitude. Uh, security yeah. issues. That's yeah. right. Order of magnitude, yeah. Well, so there's a lot of high-level content in the OAuth top 10 and whatnot. But if yeah. we drill all the way down to the programmer level, there's a lot of these new attacks and new things. But there's one that's kind of looking through you know, your book that... It existed since the very beginning of web applications, and we as an industry still haven't figured it out. Or the we figured it out, but the dust hasn't settled. We keep changing the way we do it, and that is just freaking logging in, just you know, authentication. Can you give us? And I recognize that that uh, you know we have twice as many programmers in our industry as there were seven years ago. So we have this massive number wow. of people, you know, with, who's on the first seven years of experience. So right now. Latest version, .NET 7, how should people be logging into their web applications? I mean, what they uh, should uh, should not do is uh, how we were programming it maybe 10 years ago that, you know, you write your session variable uh, and store in the session variable the username and, and then everything is done. I mean, I have to give it to ASP.NET Core. It's a super solid framework. Mm -hmm. Many of the common attacks are uh, already mitigated, or at least there are tools or APIs or approaches to, to mitigate that. And especially uh, when we talk about uh, authentication, I mean, it's it's already there. We have ASP.NET Core identity as uh, as a component of ASP.NET Core. Heck, if we are using uh, Visual Studio, there's even uh, scaffolding for uh, all the uh, all the pages and the functionality for for authentication. So it's all there. Right. Um, that's maybe because other frameworks approach a similar thing that people stop writing their own authentication um, mechanism and, and and persisting the currently logged in user. Um, that uh, I think it's called identification and authentication failures is now number seven on the OVAS top ten. It was ranked higher before, right? mm -hmm. but nowadays it is already there. Um, and I think the major mistake you can do these days is to write your own uh, authentication uh, mechanism. Mm -hmm. right? Because uh, that, I mean, and some technologies you just have to do it because it's not there. So sometimes you rely on an external library, but of course, then you have an external dependency, which is also a risk, right? So it's always a trade off. Um, uh, but but a hard threat, especially with ASP.NET Core, it's it's already there. We have ASP.NET Core identity. Um, if we would like to use uh, OAuth or OpenID Connect, I mean, the 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 the, the, the libraries are there. Uh, so it's basically all baked in. The only thing miss missing is, is an, uh, an identity server because the identity server um, is a commercial product now. But I mean, I, I may be biased, but I'm, I'm happily using it, right? So mm -hmm. it's a fantastic tool and uh, I mean, really saves so much time. But even without that, you can do it. It's, uh, it's, all, it's all baked in. So uh, very little external dependency is necessary unless... You write your own, and I think it, that and that's a general rule of thumb, at least for me, in terms of security. Don't write your own security, right? Mm -hmm. Because uh, some uh, larger groups with maybe higher know-how uh, will have all impl or was, uh, already implemented it um, in in the framework you're using. And that's especially true for ASP.NET Core. Give your quick thoughts on identity server and when, why you like it for certain scenarios versus maybe just integrating with Azure Active Directory or 
if all of the users mm -hmm. are in a company that uses Microsoft 365, or yeah, maybe yeah. everybody's already using Google Apps and has that login, how, how do you yeah. sort through those in your head? Many thanks to our podcast sponsor, Clear Measure. Clear Measure is a software architecture company that empowers clients' development teams to be self-sufficient, moving fast, delivering quality, and running their systems with confidence. Whether starting a new project or developing new technologies or techniques, Clear Measure sets up your team to deliver world-class results. Learn more at www.clearmeasure.com. Clear Measure, empowering software delivery. Clear Measure is also happy to be a sponsor of the video podcast, Programming with Palermo. Watch, learn, and program alongside Chief Architect Jeffrey Palermo. Videos are added weekly and available on syndicated locations supporting video podcast or by visiting palermo.network. Tune in today. I think if, if you use one of these uh, stand, let, let me let me just call them standards. If you're using one of those standards, it's it, it's fine either way. So... I'm not judgmental here. I mean, uh, uh, especially since since I, I come from from Europe, where GDPR is a, a very hot topic. Uh, sometimes uh, companies are reluctant or just can't go to a cloud that's uh, hosted outside the EU or mm -hmm. is under the sure. non-EU jurisdiction, right? So in that case, uh, hosting uh, or hosting some a product like uh, identity server yourself or just use something something else uh, absolutely makes sense. Um, but I mean, what uh, what what kind of features do we need from from these systems, right? So they 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 do the the heavy lifting. They they implement um, implement uh, the standards like OAuth two, OpenID Connect. They properly uh, handle handle your tokens. Uh, they provide endpoints uh, to to refresh a token. You know all, all that all that nitty gritty stuff, and they all do that really really well. Right, I I mean, years years ago, I I I was writing functionality like this, like this myself, right? Because you know the the, the tools were not there, the frameworks were not there, but it's hard work, and I mean it's getting more and more complicated. The one thing I, I do like about uh, identity server though is that um, for for single page applications, um, a a rather recent trend is. That if you want to uh, secure them with authentication, uh, you uh, are or at least many are moving to the the BFF pattern. So that's not best friends forever; <laughs> it's backends for front ends. Yeah. Um, and so the idea is, uh, and I mean, I, I simplify this a little bit, that the, uh, the single page application talks to a server, a a a, a backend, and that is secured by a session. And that backend is then um, handling the tokens because there's always a risk that someone is stealing your token. Mm -hmm. right? um, so if you store it in, say, local storage and you have cross-site scripting, then uh, you you might be host. I mean, there are ways to prevent cross-site scripting, so the injection of JavaScript these days, which is uh, pretty efficient. But what works really great is securing sessions. So basically, all you need to do is uh, you uh, use HTTPS all over the place. Um, and uh, then uh, you protect the session cookie with a couple of flags so that JavaScript doesn't see them. And since thus, uh, th therefore, sessions are kind of more secure, quote unquote, than uh, storing tokens locally, that's an upcoming trend. And the identity server has already uh, a module for that, right? So mm. it works out of the box. And that's that's what I like about that. But um, nothing against all the other cloud hosted options. I mean, they. They basically, yeah, what, what, yeah. what all of them do is, right, you have an SDK or some API and then just you, you plug it in, but you don't roll your own security. And I think that's that's the most important aspect there. Yeah. Awesome. Well, another another aspect that I just I hear lots of discussion about, even in the latest versions of, of ASP.NET, what is your favorite mechanism today in this recording, 2023, for securing HTTP web services? You would not count. It depends as a valid answer to that, right? <laughs> if it's an SPA, well, no. Or let me, let me, let me, let me start it again. So, if 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 the API, if it's a classical document-based application, mm -hmm. that's one thing, right? Is it an API that's consumed by someone else? Yes. Yeah. That's the second aspect, yeah. and the third aspect is 
the API has one consumer, it's your SPA using mm -hmm. that application, but it runs somewhere else, right? In the SPA case, uh, I um, would uh, go with uh, the BFF approach. Um, and I mean, um, I, I, would go, I would go with the identity server option here, right? Because it's okay. so, so convenient and just well done. But of course, that's not a must. Right? Uh, so that could be implemented uh, as well. Um, with with a rather rather little effort, mm -hmm. rather, right? Um, if it's document based and then just talking talking to the API, you might consider well the the authentication of the API is probably the same as for the web application. So if it's session based, then it's session based. Um, but if you have an API that is consumed by someone else, it also depends. I mean, you can do um, OAuth or OpenID Connect. Uh, well, let's let's just say OAuth. Uh, you could do OAuth, uh, OAuth, um, but then on the other hand, you still need um, uh, need uh, the uh, the 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 system to 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 issue those tokens, right? So if if you could use whatever either Microsoft's or, or Google's, or can, you can you can roll your own. Um, but uh, in in most cases, I would uh, use a token. Um, most of the time, we're using uh, JSON Web Tokens uh, as as the format, right? Um, and uh, that's that's what you use for securing that. But there's, uh, I mean, there was this this kind of notion a couple of years ago that the sessions should be avoided, and uh, you know, serverless is still mm -hmm. a very hot topic, and I, I see a lot of value in that. But from a security perspective, uh, sessions uh, are not uh, as problematic as they may have been. Couple of years ago, because nowadays they can be secured. Ten years ago, um, session attacks were mm -hmm. riding high. Right, right. And you said JavaScript web tokens. I think what a lot of people JSON see. Web token. Sorry, sorry, you're right. JSON web yeah. token. When a lot of people see JWT, and at first yeah. I even looked, I'm like JWT Java. <laughs> so I have to be honest with you that the very first time I saw that before knowing what it is, I thought it would be a, a new Java framework. Right, <laughs> right. So I, I just said, okay, let's let's look at something else first. But that was for, not a good idea. For people who have no idea what a JSON yeah. Web Token is, can you kind of give a your description of JWT? Yeah, of course. So you the the idea is you have a token, and uh, that uh, token consists of uh, well, basically three parts uh, most of the time. Um, so the token is a string, and the string is base64 encoded, right? So uh, it's converted to uh, digits and uppercase and lowercase characters. And the token consists of three parts. They're separated by a dot. And if you decode that those three base64 strings, you get, for the first part, a JSON structure in the JavaScript object notation, so curly braces, uh, value in double quotes, colon, uh, name mm -hmm. in double quotes, colon, value in double quotes. And the, the first section says, what kind of token is it? So in most cases, JWT, and what algorithm was used for signing the token? Um, there are symmetric ones, asymmetric ones. So that's the first part, it's like a header. The second part is the payload, and the payload contains name value pairs. Uh, usually it's claims, so basically, you could say properties the token has. So I'm this user, or I have the role of a uh, group administrator. Um, uh, when was the token issued? When does the token expire? Stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That's also base64 encoded, right? So we have a block of base64 encoded header, dot, base64 encoded payload, dot. And I mean, so far it's easy. So far I could craft the token myself. So I just craft the token, right? That So my name is Jeffrey Palermo. Um, and then I send it to your application. And then, you know, I, I have, I have uh, full rights. The third part is the signature. And so this token is signed. And of course, that make, makes it uh, hard to for me to craft a token when it's signed with your secret key, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and that token um, is then uh, usually sent uh, in, uh, as an HTTP header to, say, an API call, and then can be validated by the server. The server then uh, checks whether the, the signature is valid uh, and then could check other things. So for instance, sometimes there's an audience. So for which website was this token issued? The reason being maybe you have you know one set of users, but then you have a, a staging system and a live system. Mm -hmm. A token issued for the staging system should not be valid on the on the live system, right? Um, and so that token then can can be sent as part of the request. Um, 
and uh, then you don't have a session that's that's open and in that session somewhere on a server data is stored like what kind of user is that but you're stateless now so mm -hmm. the api gets this token sees the token is valid and then within the token sees okay this user has the privilege to uh, uh, to to view order data yeah and then yeah. can return order data or not i think that's a huge breakthrough compared with you know 10 years ago 20 years ago beyond yeah. because it kind of lets you hand off an envelope of stuff inside and then they can yeah. pass it back to you but you can have any number of nodes in a, a web farm or any number of container processes running it and you don't yeah. have to have sticky sessions but yet you can yeah. have confidence that they did not open the envelope or change anything inside of it yeah they didn't change it yeah exactly i mean the signature comes after the payload data so if someone was to intercept the token mm -hmm. uh, they would be able to see what's inside the token right but they cannot change it so they cannot turn christian into jeffrey or vice uh, or vice versa right but if they have the token they it's like a key right if they find the correct lock they, they can send the, the token to that endpoint so the token needs to be protected yeah yeah we could go on and on about this topic as we round up the end of our time here in your book, you also go on a chapter about audit tools. In today's you know, landscape, are there some tools where, that you always reach for and always use where you could recommend you know, 80% of the time they should be using you know, X, Y, or Z? Yeah, um, I mean, there, there are different, uh, different aspects to, to auditing. I mean, uh, you could, uh, first of all, you, you can differentiate between uh, static auditing or, or dynamically auditing an application right statically is you're checking the code dynamically means the application is running and you you know you fire at it and then see see what what sticks mm -hmm. and what happens right um i mean if if you have a the 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 dynamic uh, analysis uh there are commercial tools but i mean if if you would like to uh, test out some auditing yourselves uh, since you already mentioned OVASP, OVASP has a project called zap so z a p that's z a p the z attack proxy um which is like a free auditing tool and it, i mean uh, a little bit simplified it, it works like this it goes to a web application then it spiders it right crawls it looks for all of the endpoints, then shoots stuff at the endpoints and then tries to analyze the data being returned and then says, okay, you know, that's looks like an attack would have been successful or not. And I mean, the, the art is not uh, clicking, clicking run uh, in the Zap tool. The artist then looking at the hundreds of matches and then see, okay, is this real an attack or is this a false positive? Mm -hmm. Most of the time that's it. So, so that's for our dynamic code analysis. Um, for static code analysis, um, there exists a variety of tools, but that always depends a little bit on not only the budget, um, but uh, also on uh, the, the stack you're using and what, what tools you're using. What I find pretty interesting, though, is uh, especially if you host your code on uh, on GitHub, also in a, a private repository. So GitHub, they have they've really ramped up their, their security offerings and they, they have a secret scanner, for instance, um, they uh, can also do uh, a static code analysis and and look for um, certain stuff there. And what I also like is uh, Dependabot because what what I find a lot um, is that uh, and I think number that's number six in the OVS top ten uh, vulnerable and outdated components. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I, I think I, I always have too many NuGet packages, but I still try to you know keep them keep them at at a limit, especially. And non-official ones. With non-official ones, I mean not Microsoft ones, right? Mm -hmm. So it sounds harsher than it is, because every for every dependency I'm using, I'm I'm owning the security of of that dependency. Yeah. And it's getting even worse if uh, we have a, a, a single page application framework with lots of JavaScript, because then we usually have a lot of npm or yarn modules. Um, and what Dependabot does on uh, GitHub, it scans for outdated versions and just then you know informs you even creates a pull request for you to to update the dependency it's of course still your responsibility to then actually verify mm -hmm. that after that update everything continues working so if you have a high test coverage you have the confidence that that could be the case so i think that's an important factor for for security that that you have a high test coverage as well so that you can update things um but yeah so that's that's i think what what i uh, what i would be using but yeah apart from that um 
uh, automated code scans is an interesting tool to to help with an audit but please don't uh, run it and then just you know uh, do the the executive summary and say ah today i found 150 things which could be 100% false positives and yesterday mm-hmm. 160 so the application got more secure no it's just it's just the starting point of of a real audit and should really be used in order to find any issues not to kind of automatically lag or or you know create a chart which gives gives a false sense of uh, progress so uh, you mentioned errors. the automated code scans what's your favorite tool for even doing that it depends a little bit on the um, uh, on the uh, on the uh, technology or language uh, being used. Um, I like the one uh, in uh, in GitHub, um, which uh, which is really nice because it does support uh, it does support C sharp as well. Um, there is a security code scan for uh, for C sharp code as a, uh, a Visual Studio tool. Or also .NET command line tool. It's called Security Code Scan. It should be Security Code Scan GitHub IO. I think with dashes, if I'm uh, not mistaken. So that's a static code anal- uh, uh, analyzer, uh, analyzer. Sorry, <laughs> analyzer for .NET. Um, that looks for a couple of things, but I mean, with web with web applications, I think the the options are limited. I mean, what what this? I think this code scan is a great example. So it looks, mm-hmm. for instance, for SQL injection. So it looks for you know probably strings that look like SQL and then um, are fed uh, to 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 uh, a certain entity framework uh, core methods or to in old versions ADO.NET, and looks for other uh, things that are suspicious. But it is hard to automatically detect any issues there. You have to run it against the application or you have to more manually look at it. Uh, let me give you a quick example, if I may. Um, the, the, if you just look at the numbers, the most common attack is cross-site scripting, injecting JavaScript. Mm-hmm. Now, when you output something in ASP.NET Core application, you usually use the add character, right? And then whatever, the property of your model. This automatically HTML escapes the data which prevents, I don't know, 98% of cross-site scripting vulnerabilities in a way, right? So you have no idea about cross-site scripting, but by using the add character, you are safe. But it only works in HTML. If you use that in a JavaScript block, Mm -hmm. the escaping is incorrect because ASP.NET Core has no clue that we are in JavaScript now, and rightfully so. So you have a vulnerability, hard to find the scanning. I mean, you could have a hunch, but but still, and the other aspect is instead of the add character, you can use at html.raw, which does not do escaping. You mm. need this if, say, you, have, you read data from a database and you know that there's HTML marker, but you would like to output that verbatim. Mm-hmm. But does that mean that html.raw means we have cross site scripting? No, it only means we have cross site scripting if the data that's output could come from an attacker. Yeah. And this is hard to find with a uh, static code ana- uh, analyzer. Yeah. Um, so sense. that is, especially in .NET space, I find it uh, really hard. There are, there are other languages where static code analysis is a little bit easier. If it's outside the web, I mean, if you talk about C or, or C++ code, there static code analysis is really, really, really worth a lot. Um, but in .NET space, I think uh, doing a dynamic uh, code analysis, like, so sh- um, Attacking a running web application is probably um, the the more bang for the buck approach uh, there. Or you do a manual code analysis and look for certain patterns. So looking mm-hmm. for HTML.raw, but then for each value that's output there, you backtrack it to the source and then decide is that is that tainted or not. Right, right. Awesome. Wow. This is a lot of information. Yeah, we could go on for a long time around uh, ASP.NET yeah. core security. But you have an entire book that goes deep into all of these. Uh, we will include a link to that book in the show notes and easily searchable and found. But man, thank you so much for coming on the Azure DevOps podcast and and talking to us about about uh, web security. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Jeff. Oh, my pleasure. And until next time, keep shipping. You've been listening to the Azure DevOps Podcast, a show for developers and DevOps professionals shipping software using Microsoft technologies. Go to www.azuredevops.show for show notes and other episodes. 
On behalf of your host, Jeffrey Palermo, and our sponsors, thanks for listening, and may God bless you.